Welcome to Preaching That Matters. A place you can find apostolic Pentecostal preaching. A place where all generations can be fed with the Word of God. We hope you enjoy. While we're standing, I'm going to ask you if you would to turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter number 12. Genesis chapter number 12. We're going to begin reading when you get there with verse number 1. Genesis 12 verse number 1. It's great to be in his house. Great to feel his presence. There's nothing in the world as wondrous as knowing him and um, walking with him, enjoying him, and allowing him to do what he wants to do. Can you say amen? So I want to echo the words of your pastor of deep appreciation. Um, God has a lot of troopers. He really, he really does. Some real troopers in his kingdom. And um, I don't know if this is fair or right or not, but it seems like this church has more than its share. And we thank God for you and your, your diligence, your faithfulness. It's just, it's exemplary and it's very touching to us. Very, very touching to us. And I can only imagine what it means to God. So we thank God for you and for what all he's doing in your lives and what he wants to do in this Inland Empire and is doing. So we just go forward. In verse 1 of Genesis 12, we find these words. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. Now that's, that's all heavy duty stuff right there. It's, we've read it enough. We don't stop and pause and think, but what if God was talking to you? To you. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Let's, let's pray together. And um, I, I've, if we will just take a breath and pay attention in the Holy Ghost, I believe that God I, I really do believe he wants to talk to all of us because he wants to use all of us. Lord Jesus, we're mindful of you. As always, God, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your presence. We do not take it for granted, but we are deeply, deeply thankful. We ask that your word have free course, not just these next few moments, but God in every single life, God to every ear that is hearing, let it truly be a listening ear. Let our ears and hearts and minds and souls and spirits be obedient and receptive, God and distributive for you and your kingdom. In Jesus' name we commit this into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you so much. You may be seated. Now, there is um, 
a scriptural hermeneutical law of a first reference that when something appears for the first time in scripture that makes other appearances down through chapters and books and epics and even eons that that first reference holds great importance. It is to be paid attention to, as are, of course, all other scriptures. But it is a precedent-setting situation. And as such, it needs to be examined and contemplated. And um, as much as is possible, laid hold upon, amen, with hearts and souls and minds and spirits. We're reading here our first reference to a man named Abram, which means father, and his name would later be changed to Abraham, which we know far better. And um, he is exalted father, and we know the father of many nations, and we know the father of the faithful. Moreover, the scripture refers to him because God, through scripture, referred to him as his friend. He is the friend of God. Now, anyone that is a friend of God and God claims him to be so, um, that person needs to be paid attention to. Now, Abraham, as is every other figure in Scripture, save the God-man, Jesus Christ, who was the invisible God made visible, the divine, the divinity of God becoming humanity. With him can be said as Pilate, I find no fault in him. There is no fault to be found in Jesus Christ, though the world has got worked over time to do so. Having said that, all other Bible figures, it is relatively easy to find fault with, save the one example of Daniel. Very unbelievable, exceptional man. But he was human, and the Bible does let us know that when the great, at the great white throne of judgment, um, basically every crown will be thrown at his feet. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Daniel will be in that number, and his crown, he will also know I'm only here because he paid the price for me and he will throw his crown as well. So Abraham is no exception. His life was exemplary by far. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about. But he was human and he did make mistakes. We're not here to talk about uh, his mistakes. We know that he took Hagar, Egyptian maid, to wife at the instigation of his wife Sarah, and the repercussions of that um, are being felt in the world we live in today, literally, literally so. But be all that as it may, uh, this is the man that God spoke to, and we already made mention, it's one thing to read it, but it's another thing to comp- contemplate it, and it's another thing to slip your feet in his shoes and and stop and consider your world today if God were to speak to you and say, get out of your country. I want you to go to another nation. Whether we're talking Canada or Mexico, that's trippy, let alone across the seas or down into Central or South America. And get away from your kindred. Get away from your family. Get away from your father's house. You keep going till you get to a land that I'm going to show you. 
Now that in itself, that's heavy duty. That's, that's, that's what you call uprooting on grand scale. And you may say, yes, but, you know, life was less complicated then, and da na 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 Well, we can take planes and ships. How's that? He had to walk. And the tendrils that bound him to family members, friends, the world, the only world he had known, he's not a spring chicken, folks. He is 75 years of age. That's a long time for roots to go deep in any society. And he has to pull them up every tendril. That which doesn't make it out of the ground will be ripped in his heart and he'll feel the pain forever. But he tells him, the reason I'm doing this is that I'm going to make you into a great nation. And I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to make thy name great. Now that all by itself kind of tips the scales pretty much. It's not like you're going to pay, 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 pay and not be repaid. Because the repayment is going to be beyond what you can imagine. You are going to a place you don't yet know, but you and your progeny are going to become a great nation. Your name's going to be great. I am going to bless you. And he says, thou shalt be a blessing. I'm going to bless you, and thou shalt be a blessing. Now, humanity on its own enjoys the thought of almost any kind of blessings, um, any kind of gain, any type of advantage, uh, whatever it would be. I mean, that's just, that's just human nature. If you get a deal in the mail and um, somebody has... Uh, sent you a $1,000 check, I said, and said, I borrowed this from you 25 years ago. You probably forgot. Well, here it is, plus interest. You're not going to rip the check up. Very probably you're going to cash it. Um, if, if you get a deal in the mail and you have just won 50 gallons of free gasoline, you'll use it. If you get, if you get a Deal in the mail, you say, well, I'm not really high on McDonald's. Well, you get a $100 gift certificate, and you'll find out those fries taste better than you thought they were. There's just something about getting and being, and being blessed. There's just, there's just, we, just, we just enjoy it, and, and humanity gets spoiled rather easily and quickly. But the phrase, thou shalt be a blessing doesn't usually latch in as deep as does the former statement, you're going to be blessed. But the reason God said this to Abraham, one, is because it was true. But secondly, knowing the nature of this man, he knew that being blessed from God, oh, thank you. But being used of God to bless was also very important to him. And it needs to be very important to us. In fact, I'm going to give you the title of what I'm talking about today, and that is God's Standard for Being Blessed and Being a Blessing. God has a standard and by the law of first reference, the standard that he sets is found in this man, Abram. And so if you would like to be blessed, and if you would like to be a blessing, we need to look closely and examine and contemplate and fathom and lay hold on what it was that God did with and for this man. And, and, and make proper application in our life. Because these things, amen, that were written aforetime, the apostle tells us they were written for our admonition. They're written for our example. 
So these things are here to teach us, you and I, all of these things that are written and these things that happened unto them. Amen. They were there to be our teachers. And we are not in Abraham's dispensation. We are in a more important dispensation of Abraham than Abraham. We are the dispensation upon whom the ends of the world have come. We are the, in the dispensation of the fullness of times where God has gathered together everything in heaven and in earth. All principles, or all, excuse me, all precepts and principles, amen, found back from Genesis on up Amen. Through it, especially incorporated and unfolded in the New Testament. And now we are the last actors on the last stages of, of, this, of this dispensation. We are in that fullness. And all of these things are our schoolmasters to bring us to Christ and for the purposes of today to be blessed and to be a blessing. We're not just here to inhale and exhale. We are not just here, amen, to go through our days. We're not just here to exist, amen. We are here to take on eternal importance and everlasting righteousness and blessings and to be everlastingly righteous and be a blessing. Seriously, that's not small. If you think what Abraham's words that he received were big, well, they're bigger for us than they were for him. It's more important that we listen than he listened. And without him listening, where would we be? Without us listening, where will others be? This is not small potatoes. This is not just, well, let's go to church on Sunday morning and inhale and exhale a little while, lift our hands. And No, 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 no. This kingdom is not as tawdry as that. And the reason that so much of Christianity, or rather, if I can be a little tawdry, churchianity is so boring to so many is because there is, there is no feelings and pathos and and something that grips of eternal consequence. Brothers and sisters, there, is, there are no small potatoes in this place. There are no small issues when it comes to the kingdom, when it comes to his word. It's all important. So he said, I want to make you a blessing, and I want to bless you. Well, he's the father of the faithful. If God was that way with the father, then that's what he wants to do with the children. That's God's way. That's God's plan. It's part, of the, part and parcel of the message of the sure mercies of David. This thing is generational. God wants it to be generational. He won't make any generation or any human live for him. But if you want to, you can buy into something that is of Again, everlasting consequence. The increase of his government, the Bible says, there shall be no end. This is the only thing where the law of thermodynamics does not work out. The law of thermodynamics is that everything diminishes. Buy a new car, and if you do not continually through the years pour lots of money into it, even with paint jobs or whatever, it's going to eventually rust out and become nothing. It has to have constant repair. These human bodies in the shape we're in, it's the same way. You have to continually be feeding it. You have to continually be bathing it. If you don't, it begins to deteriorate. And guess what? I got news for you all. Listen to this 67 year old man. On your best day, keep it up, but you're gonna deteriorate anyway until this corruption puts on the incorruption and this mortality puts on immortality and then it's a different world. The increase of that government, kingdom, power, glory, there's no end. Everything else diminishes. Amen. Byzantium is gone except for location. Amen. The Sumerian Empire is over. The Assyrian 
is gone. The Babylonian is gone. Amen. The Medes and the Persian is gone. The Roman Empire is gone. It's splintered up. Amen. There's feet of clay mixed with iron. It's, it's the law of thermodynamics. But there is a mountain. Amen. There is a stone being cut out of a mountain that's going to come into this earth and smash everything to pieces and it will grow forever. That's why what we're talking about today is buying into that mountain and those blessings and God's plan. So he tells the father of the faithful, those of his progeny where he said, if you can count the sands of the sea, I'll tell you how many kids you're going to have. If you can number the stars of the heavens, amen, I will do the same. He's the father of the faithful. He's the father of the nation of Israel down through these millennium. How many have there been? They're, they're, the, they're the earthy descendants of Abraham, sands of the sea. But we, he is the father of the faithful. Amen. The heavenly kingdom is the stars of the heavens. And the Bible said, around about the throne, there was a number which no man could number out of every nation, kindred, people, and tongue. And all of them are buying into, if you please, to be blessed and be a blessing as our father Abraham. So we examine our father Abraham. We pay close attention to him. Now having given a uh, rather lengthy introduction, there's only four main criteria that we need to examine. The first, when it came to Abram slash Abraham receiving and becoming, receiving blessings and becoming blessing. First was the ability to take, to receive instruction. It's that simple. Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. That's, again, no small deal. But the principle is, and in a way, that's still true. I mean, there is a country of sin. There is a country of a fallen world we're in. There, the whole world lieth in wickedness. And so in the sense that when someone comes to God now to enter into the heavenly kingdom, to go into the heavenly kingdom, you got to leave the earthly kingdom. You say, well, Brother Booker, okay, you haven't noticed, we're like still here. Well, we're here, but we're not here. He said, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. We have left aspects of that world, when, when a person goes out of darkness into his marvelous light, now we don't, we don't talk like the world. You say, but we use English. Yes, but we try to keep it within the bonds of decency of King James English, if you please. Meaning, we don't cuss like sailors. We don't even cuss like mad grannies that don't know Jesus. We just don't cuss. Because our language has taken on a new tone intent. Amen. We don't, you, in case you haven't noticed, uh, there's an election coming. Did you know that? Anybody else know that? You may notice that? And everybody's speaking so sweetly and so kindly of each other. They're building each other up in their most political faith. I'm going to tell you something. I think of something that Niccolo Machiavelli said in the 1500s. He wrote it, his little book, The Prince, for Cesare Borgia, who was the son of Pope Leo X. And, uh, and, and he said, politics has no relation to morals. Politics has no relation to morals. And I don't, I don't see where he really misses it. Having said that, 
I've never voted in an election, but what I feel like I'm voting for lesser of evils. And, uh, and we're not going to get off on all that. But this is not a rosy, peachy, pinch your cheek, smiley, let's build each other up, make each other happy world right now. But can I tell you something in a world where it is so dark, there's no reason for the church not to shine like the noonday sun. There's no reason for you in your family that perhaps is still in darkness for you not to shine. Amen. That doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you come in the door of the house and your family's not there, or your family's there, and they're not living for Jesus. Let's, you are, but let's just say you're not. And so you come in, and with your Bible, and then when you go out the door, they miss you so deeply. But you can walk into the house like a bright light and with a smile on your face. Amen. And as if the Holy Ghost helps you, and their hunger is great, when you leave, there's something aching that says, I wish I had their peace. I wish I had their hope. And God knows I need their help. We need to shine. We need to shine. We need to shine in truth. We need to shine in kindness. We need to shine in the love of God. So we're in the world and we're not of the world. Okay, our family may feel like we've left them. Church is more important to you than we are. I had to look at my parents who had traveled 650 miles one way to be with me for a few days and I was in church a lot and they were leaving the next day and, and I was accused of not loving my parents by a fellow church member in front of my parents. If you loved your parents, you would stay home and be with them tonight and not run off to church. And I had to look at my parents and say, you knew me before I got before God found me. Lawyers tried to help me. Doctors tried to help me. Psychologists tried to help me. Counselors tried to help me. Educators tried to help me. Good and bad police tried to help me. God knows you tried to help me. Nobody could help Larry Booker. Nobody. But Jesus helped me. And he used the agency of his church. And... It's the only thing that's been able to help me. And I don't ever want to go back to where I was, so I love you dearly and deeply more than you'll ever know, but I'm going to stick with what helped me. I'm going to stick with what helped me. And that was the night, reading, looking at the book of Psalms when my pastor was preaching, I felt God call me. In fact, I knew that moment. From that moment on, I was called to preach. So, there's something about taking and receiving instruction. The principle that Abraham obeyed instantly. He began his trek. He headed out, not even knowing where he was going, but God would show him this land. So just to wrap that up, if you want to be blessed, you have to be willing to take the blesser's instructions. Amen. He knows where the blessings are. He knows how to bless, but he loves obedience. And if you can take, receive, take, and act upon his instructions, amen, then you get under the spigot where the blessings are. Amen. Anybody ever glad you heard about the subject of repentance? Anybody ever glad you heard of the subject of baptism in Jesus' name?
Anybody here thankful you heard about receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost? And on the first day of the church, you talk about law, first reference. You talk about paying attention when people, amen, were saying to Simon, Peter, and the apostles, men and brethren, we've messed up. What shall we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the mission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Hallelujah. Anybody here been blessed? Anybody here been blessed? If you want to be blessed, take and receive instruction. Amen. First and foremost, get into the kingdom. And the, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We die in repentance. We're buried with him in baptism. We rise to walk in newness of life when the spirit that raised him from the dead fills us. Amen. With his spirit. And now we've died been buried, and we rose again. This taking and receiving and acting upon instructions is a pretty good business. Amen. We're talking about Abraham today. Now, we know, and there are many names given of people in Abraham's day that he met. He bought graves from them, <coughs> lands from them, went in and out of their kingdoms, on and on. There's many names associated with Abraham's world, okay? Everybody that can name a name of somebody that he hung around with or knew, raise your hand. There's a few. And if you really thought, you could think, that's my point. We don't remember their names. Their names don't stand up. They may have been big names in their day, such as Abimelech, the king of Gerar. Who's heard of him now? But how many have heard of the name of Abraham? He said, I'll make your name great. And here we are, these, these thousands upon thousands of years later, and everybody, most everybody, still knows at least the name Abraham has portent to it. And we know him as the father of the faithful. That's because he knew how to take and receive instructions. So, second point, to be blessed and to be a blessing. First, take and receive instructions. Second, do whatever God says, even if you don't like it. Or you don't understand the command. Not everything God told him to do was just like, oh, goody, I've been waiting a long time to leave my family. No, you just, you do what you got to do. Here's another one. In Genesis 17, this is a few years down the road. Verse 10, this is my covenant which you shall keep, Abraham, between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. That was in verse 10 and 11. Verse 23. And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, Every male among the men of Abraham's house and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the self same day as God had said unto him. And he was no doubt first partaker. That's one thing to read, but it's another thing to consider. He said, Okay, God, uh, this is August. I think long about October we'll be ready. No. That day. And that's not something. I want you to listen to me. When Abraham said, okay, everybody, God just spoke. Whoa, what did he say? Well, this is what he had to say. Can you imagine how many people went pale? Can you imagine how many people gulped? And this is before the days of anesthesiology. You hear me? 
We're talking about a rough day. And then, even to this day, doctors say that whenever that procedure has to be taking place for medical reasons or whatever, if, if you're the, the most propitious time for ever any male child to ever be circumcised for the least possible carryover effect of pain and everything else is when they're eight days old. To this day, doctors know that. All Jewish doctors know that. Literally, physically, it's the best. And, uh, but when you're older than that, the third day is by far, they say, the worst, to where even with medications of today, where in the book of Genesis, when the sons of Hamor and his kingdom did it trying to appease Israel, the Bible says that three days later, the men couldn't even move. And Simeon and Levi walked through with total impunity, taking their time, not, a, not probably even breaking sweat. They couldn't even defend themselves to save their lives. And Simeon and Levi slaughtered. So this is no small deal. But Abraham said, today we do it. And another example in chapter 22, verse 2. And he, God, said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Get thee into the land of Moriah. Offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went to the place which God told him. God said, offer your son as a sacrifice. Now again, that's one thing to read that. But he took, but he knew this, this is the son of promise. I'm going to obey you, God. And if I kill him, you're going to have to raise him from the dead. And he laid him out on the altar up on top of Mount Moriah, they believe where the temple stood for Solomon, Ornon's threshing floor. And Isaac is large enough, big enough to carry the wood up the mount, enough wood to burn the sacrifice completely. So he's not a little wee little boy. He can carry a large stack of wood. And he said, Father, I see the bucket of hot coals in your hand. I see the knife in your sheaf. Here's the wood. I don't see the sacrifice, Dad. And he said, God will provide himself a lamb. For now, you lay down here on the wood. And if he's strong enough to carry that much wood to the top of the mount, he's also strong enough to take a hundred and at least 25-year-old man and throw him off the same mountain. But Isaac lies, and Abraham lifts the knife, and Isaac probably closed his eyes. And God said, stop. Now I know you really are going to obey me. I'm first. You fear me. You love me. And then he hears the sound, and in the thicket over yonder is a ram caught in the thicket. And the sacrifice takes place. The point is to be blessed of God and to be a blessing Take and receive instructions, the good ones and the ones that are not so hot. The ones that are enjoyable and the ones that are not quite as enjoyable. But listen, if you'll obey them all, the blessings are worth it.
The blessings are worth it. I'm just going to give you this classic case. There is a young man in this church. He's married. He's a blessing. He has, I'm just telling you, God blesses this young man and his wife. And they're a blessing mightily. And when this young man was a little boy and he got, he got, I think, I think he actually got $10 for his birthday from somebody. He's a little boy. He's so excited. And his mom said, now, honey, you, you need to pay tithes on that. He said, what's that? He said, well, that's, we give one-tenth of what God blesses us with to the Lord. She said, he put his hands on his ears and said, oh, mama, don't tell me that. Well, he did it with that first $10, and he's never stopped. And now God's blessing him six ways from Sunday. Let me tell you something, whether you like the commandments or not, you just do what he says. Trust me. He knows what he's doing. There ain't nothing like going into business with God. Take on God as your business partner. So, we... Here we obey whether we understand or not. And that carries out into hundreds of situations. Amen. Such as, if they smite you on the one cheek, turn the other. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. And on and on. So, I got two more and I'll be done. Number three. One cannot be selfish or self-centered. And one must be a lover of peace if you're going to be blessed and be a blessing. In Genesis 13 and 7, there was a strife between the herdsmen, the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled in the land. And they no doubt could see these two great vast herds of these two relatives. And their herdmen are fussing. And Abram said unto Lot. Should have been Lot talking to the elder. But the elder said to the younger, listen up. Let there be no strife, I pray, between me and you. Between my herdmen and your herdmen. Because we're brethren is not the whole land before thee. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll, I'll go to the left. You choose. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere in the Lord before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. Lot took the best chunk, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated. So Abram dwells in the land of Canaan, and Lot in the cities of the plain. But Lot had just pitched his tent towards Sodom. And we know the end thereof. The point is, how is it that Abram could be so blessed? One, he would take and receive instruction. Instructions both enjoyable and not as enjoyable. Third, I'm not going to be selfish. I'm not going to be self-centered. And we've got to have peace. So, Lot, you choose. The Perizzite and the Canaanite, they, they don't need to see us fussing. Whatever we got to do here. And I'll t you take the high road, I'll take the low road. It doesn't matter. But, so he followed after things that made for peace. He was not a selfish man. He was not self-centered man. And he was a lover of peace. If you want to be blessed of God, be obedient. Be obedient whether you understand it or not. Amen. Don't be selfish. Don't be self-centered. Be a lover of peace. And you will open the doors for yourself to be blessed. And you can go on and be a blessing. And number four, and I'll be done. 
and I'm closer than you think. To be blessed and to be a blessing from God, for God, you have to learn to pray to that God, to talk to that God, and to intercede with that God. So one day God lets him know he's literally become a theophany. He's at the tent. There are two angels with him. And the angels began marching off down to the plain that Lot had chosen. And they're marching off towards Sodom and Gomorrah. And as they begin to go, God said, Shall I hide from Abraham, my friend, that which I do? The cry of Sodom and Gomorrah has come up before me. And destruction's about to take place. And Abraham, if you're going to be blessed and be a blessing, falls on his face and said, now God, what if there's 50 righteous people in Sodom? Will you destroy it if there's 50? And God listens to his friend and he said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous, I will spare the place for those righteous people's sake. Abraham answers and says, behold now, I've taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which I'm but dust and ashes. Peradventure, what if there's lacking five of the 50? Will, will, will you destroy the city because you couldn't find just five more people? So that's a pretty unique way of saying 45, but God cut to the chase. He said, if I find there 40 and five, I will not destroy it. So then he speaks, peradventure, there shall be 40 found. God said, I, I won't do it if 40 are found. He said, oh, Lord, don't be angry. I will speak. What about 30? What if there's 30? He said, I won't do it if I find 30 there. He said, Lord, I've taken upon me to speak. Peradventure, what if there's 20 there? And the Lord said, I will not destroy it for 20's sake. Listen, folks, this really took place. He said, God, don't be angry. I'm going to talk to you one more time. If, if, 10, if 10 people are found there, what if 10 and he knew that his nephew Lot was there. Lot's wife was there. He knew that he had four daughters there. That's six. Two of them were married. That's eight. And no doubt some kids were involved. He knew he had over ten relation there. At least ten. And he said, if you can find ten... He said, I won't destroy it for ten's sake. But Lot had not chosen to be blessed and be a blessing like his uncle Abraham. Obedience to God in all of his ways was not as near and dear to Lot as it was to Abraham. Somewhere in the course of his world, Lot made adjustments with his world. He sat at the gate of the city with the elders of Sodom, of Sodom, to receive their acceptance. How many times did Lot have to keep his mouth shut? If he was a judge and an elder, how many times did he have to to twist, to take things that 
were right and turn them upside down on their head and he's still liked by the populace. And if you don't think he didn't have to do that, note the first time he withstood the wicked ribaldry of Sodom and Gomorrah whose name has forever been associated with their crime of sodomy. The first time he speaks against it, and even then, offering to these wicked men, his daughters, do what you want with them, but leave these two men alone, not knowing they were angels. And they said, you come down here to judge us? We're going to do worse to you than we were those men. And the angels had to smite them blind and pull Lot back and shut the door. And that generation was so bent on evil, they were not interested in obeying God, any commands of God. They were very self-centered. They were utterly, totally selfish. Whatever they wanted, they got. That even when they're smote blind, they're groping for the door, trying to break into Lot's house. They were so consumed with their selfish, self-centered rebellion and iniquity. And Lot makes it out by the skin of his teeth. But a man whose righteous soul was vexed, before it's over, his daughters fall him into incest. His wife's turned to a pillar of salt. His son-in-laws mock him and laugh at him when he tells them, get out of town. God's going to judge this place. It was not that way with Abraham. Abraham was of a different nature. He received instruction. Whether he understood or even liked the instructions, let's all stand. He said, no, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Amen. He decided I'm not going to be selfish. I'm not going to be self-centered. I'm going to follow after peace. And this man who obeyed, amen, that which he enjoyed and that which was not as enjoyable, but he obeyed and walked and talked with God and said, I'll not be selfish. I'll not be self-centered. I'm not, I'm not. He is the father of the faithful. And I'm closing. Listen to me. Look at our world right now. Look at our world right now. We're in a world that is very interested in any, quote, advantage it can get, blessing it can get, goodies it can get, whatever it can get. But how interested is this world in general with really being a blessing? How interested is this, in this, is this world in obeying God? Receiving instruction, any instruction, let alone God's instruction. How selfish is our world? How self-centered? How interested is our world in real, true peace? Willing to give of itself, etc. Amen. And listen to me. How little blessings are flowing. The spigot's being turned off on this nation. You hear me? The spigot is being turned off. But it doesn't have to be that way for you because God has his own spigots. Amen. He overrides it all. He oversees it all. Amen. There's days more comfortable than others. We all understand that. But, but if Jesus, I want you to know, 
I want your blessings more than anything in the world, but I want to be a blessing. I'm passing through this life one time. Let it be when I'm gone. It doesn't matter. You say, I'm not an apostle Paul. I'm not an, I'm not an apostle Simon Peter. Maybe your name is Dorcas. In the book of Acts. I made mention of this the other day. This woman, the only thing she did, she did good things for people. She was a blessing. She was in the church. She was a blessing. She died. Simon Peter raised her back up from the dead. Think about her funeral. The people that came holding little doilies that she had sewn together. Baby's booties that she made these for my boy, my little girl, when they were little. This is the woman that brought me food when I was sick, that mopped my brow when I had fever. This is the woman. Dorcas was blessed. And she was a blessing. She walked with God. When he said, repent and be baptized, she was. She was blessed with the Holy Ghost. She spent her days being a blessing and being blessed, as did the Apostle Peter, as did the Apostle Paul, as did John, as did thousands of others. And I'm closing. We've talked about the two main plagues. One in 160 AD, the Antiochian plague, I believe it is. And then the other 75 years later, Rome is scattered. People are dying in the streets. And Christian peoples walking through the streets of Rome Many of them getting sick themselves. Mopped brows. Brought water to parched lips that couldn't get enough. Would hold the hands of shaking, trembling people. And they found comfort from people that were blessed and we're interested in being a blessing. So that in 325 AD, and yes, things, a lot of elements there, but they say 10 to 12% of the entire Roman Empire was now Christian. They had grown to between 30 and 50 million of people that said, you know what? My father is faithful. He obeyed, I'm gonna obey. He did what was fun, what wasn't quite so fun. Amen. He was interested in peace. He was interested in not being selfish. He was interested in not being self-centered. He was interested in being a blessing. And he was interested in talking to his God and interceding for humanity. Those principles are the same in the year 2020. Anybody here want to be a blessing? And we, we are a blessed people. And we know that. And this church is a blessing. But, but I hope there's something that strikes fire in all of us. That says we're passing through one time. Jesus, you've blessed me. Make me the greatest possible blessing that I can be. Let's lift our hands. Let's talk to him. He's in this house. He's in this house.